It's time for Windows Weekly with Paul Throughout, episode 184. A little early this week because Microsoft has a big announcement. Paul says it's bad news. We'll also take a look at Connect and how it can protect you from accidental exposure. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 184, recorded November 23rd, 2010. Extension denied. Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, clients rely on you for fast and reliable service. Help them the fast and easy way with GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, visit audible.com slash windows. And by Carbonite Pro. With prices starting at $10 a month, all your office PCs can be backed up safely and automatically. For a free trial and to learn more, visit CarbonitePro.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, uh, the show that covers everything that's going on in Snohomish and points north. Here he is. <laughs> You're not going to get me this time. <laughs> From Denham, Massachusetts. I tried to get him to spit his coffee, but no... Mr. Paul Throughout, we're doing this very early. In fact, weirdly yeah. early because uh, not only is it uh, early in the morning, it's early in the week because normally we record on Thursdays, which is, of course, this week Thanksgiving. Right. I offered to do it on Thursday, but you were weird about it. I thought, no, I would prefer to have, I don't know. <laughs> the family and the stuff. The family, turkey, all that stuff. We're actually going to go right. out of town. I'm going to take two days off, unheard of. I'll be yes. back for the radio show, but um, two days off. Where are you going? Uh, to visit uh, Jennifer's papa in Santa Cruz. It's going to be great fun. I'm looking forward cool. to it. Yes. We have lots to talk about, but before we begin, in a minute, yep. as we record this, which is uh, 9.30 Pacific uh, on, on Tuesday, the 23rd, uh, a big announcement is going to be made. You already know the details of the announcement. You, you are embargoed, I take it. Right. So. And you said it's bad news. Should we wait 30 seconds? I think we should. Okay, let's just... I'll do a little blog post like about it while we're... It's like being in an elevator with Paul. Each of us are looking straight forward or wait at our for shoes. It. <laughs> now, by the way, that's an atomic clock behind me, so this is absolutely... Absolutely accurate. So in three, two, one, you can now tell us the bad news. You said it was bad news. It is bad news. Oh, dear. As uh, listeners of this podcast know, I've spent the last several years advocating the use of Windows Home Server. And uh, Microsoft will be announcing any second now that they are removing the drive extender technology from Windows Home Server Veil, vale, which is the next version, as well as from Small Business Server. And they will not be... Uh, developing that technology any further. <laughs> Hold on. I know you're trying to be funny. <laughs> this is actually very serious. Is it because really? Because I have no idea what you just said. Drive Extender is responsible for two important functions of Windows Home Server, arguably the core of the product. Um, that includes uh, data duplication across two physical disks. You mean like backup? No, I mean duplication so that if one hard drive fails, your data won't go oh, with like it. like mirroring. So, yeah. I guess. And also a uh, single pool of data, right? Um, other Windows versions all have drive letters. So if you have a, let's say you have a D drive and it's literally a one terabyte drive. And on, the, on that one terabyte drive, all you have are videos. So you have your videos share on that drive. Right. But then you exceed the storage on that drive and you want to have videos also on a second drive. Well, in Windows Home Server previously, you didn't have to worry about that. You would just plug in the drive, add it to the pool of storage. It was infinite. It could just keep growing. Oh, but I now see. under the new version, if you have a share that's on the D drive and you want to have videos on another share or another drive, there's no way to combine them, at Ooh. least not easily. Why would they, uh, are they having trouble with it? 
No. Well, yes, now they are. So uh, Drive Extender <laughs> has gone through. Well, now they are. <laughs> let me, I'm sorry. Let me. Uh, uh, Drive Extender was responsible for that data corruption uh, corruption bug that occurred at the first gen, right? 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 That, yeah. that actually wasn't a very serious problem in the sense that it didn't actually affect a lot of users. Um, but it was a serious problem in that Microsoft has, had intended for Drive Extender to become the basis for its storage uh, systems in Windows Server and then eventually on Windows Client as well. So for the second version, the one that will be coming out next year, they re-architected it and they started adding it to other products. So there's a version of Small Business Server, uh, previously codenamed Aurora, that was going to include this Drive Extender technology as well. Now, Windows Home Server is sort of a niche product. Um, Windows Small Business Server is not a niche product. And of course, um, companies want to run applications on top of that thing, server applications and so forth. And what they found now under this new system where people were in fact trying to run major applications on it, that it didn't work. And they actually just couldn't fix it to make it work. And they decided that from a data integrity standpoint, the only thing they could do was just to get rid of it. So they literally are getting rid of it. And it will not appear in the future in some other form. It's not going to come back. It's not going to be in Windows client. It's just gone forever. Well, they're really upset in Snohomish about this. Yeah. Ken Anderson's here, and he's actually a user. You use Windows Home Server. So, this, so see, I, as a non-user, yeah. I have no idea what this means, but, I, but you've explained it, I think, and, and this sounds like well, kind of critical functionality. It's, it is critical. Consider, consider it this way. So uh, if you have a, a machine in your home network that has media on it, and that's how you want to share it over the home network, you know, you could use a computer, obviously. Uh, it, you could use Windows XP or 7 or whatever. Um, there are certain limitations when you do that around what I just described, the, the storage. So if you want to have data duplication, it's pretty complicated. You could do things like RAID, which is very complicated. You could use uh, Drobo, which works well, actually, by the way. And I, but the one thing I told to Microsoft was that you're probably going to send Drobo's share price to the roof if they have, a sh if they have stock. Um, because Drobo becomes the obvious solution for this problem on the server side, you know, for a small business server. Not don't, don't, I mean, at most NAS storage solutions have something like this. It's basically yes. RAID. Right. But the thing is, no solution has all of this stuff so together there, in one so thing. So without Drive words, Extender, there's no data redund there's no redundancy, there's no uh, data protection on, on home server or business well, server? Well, there's no data redundancy. There, there are basic data protection features that are just inherent to Windows, but okay. there's no data... Um, redundancy, I think is the way to put it, native to the system. But the other thing is that single pool of storage. You know, one of the beautiful things about uh, Windows Home Server originally was that it was ushering in this new era where we were going to get rid of drive letters and Windows, finally, you know. And right. for that reason I just described, you know, that there are actually Windows Server technologies that get around this, like DFS and so forth, but they're, they're complicated. And especially for the home server market, they're just uh, non-starters, you know, that one of the beautiful things about Windows Home Server was that it provide it, it still works. Obviously, it still works today in the original version, but it provides this system where you get all of this stuff together in one simple little inexpensive package. You know, not just data redundancy, not just server backup, not just uh, single pool of storage, not just Windows compatible file shares and, and media share that works over your home network with all your devices and all that, but this stuff all together. You know, in one package with other features as well. So. I think from Microsoft's perspective, what they're thinking is that um, the market will respond to this and that the, the, the big market here is for small business server, not for Windows Home Server. And that that market is already well served by third parties who have offer things like RAID solutions right. and other data redundancy solutions and so forth. So this really uh, means, does this, this almost is like a, a death blow to SBS, right? That's SBS, but maybe to Windows Home Server. The problem for Windows Home Server is once you strip away this, it still has other stuff that's pretty interesting, but it becomes a lot less interesting. You know, it's not as valuable as it used to be. You know, if you have five major features in Windows Home Server, and I'm making that number up, but let's say there are five, this actually removes two of them. Yikes. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So as a result... Uh, <laughs> that's 40%. That's if right. my math is correct. Sure. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's not good. So It's not good. So, and, and that's uh, because it was broken, and they couldn't fix it. Well, for, for the purpose for which it was... In Windows Home Server, it worked fine. But one of the things that is coming in Vail and is coming in this new version of Small Business Server is a server extensibility model that is common across both of those products. And also there's a third product that's a storage server 
uh, product, which is somewhat ironic when you just consider that they killed the storage aspects of this product. But um, these things share a common extensibility model, which is actually very powerful. Um, it allows you to do things like uh, access hosted exchange and have the management of hosted exchange be integrated into the console for small business server, you know, and have it seem like a seamless uh, single product. Um, those not the, actually, it's not the hosted stuff that was the problem. The problem was that when you run a traditional server application on top of small business server, it doesn't work with this, um, with this uh, drive extender technology. If anyone out there who's listening to this has tested Veil or uh, small business server Aurora, they know that one of the weird things that changed was for every share on the server, Microsoft created a new drive letter. And this was very different from the way that Windows Home Server worked in the past. And I, I had to ask them about this repeatedly because I really couldn't figure out what the point of the system was or how you uh, turn it off or re-enabled it for your own shares and all this. It was very complicated. But what that was was an attempt to get server applications to work under this drive extender technology. And it just wasn't working. So uh, it will be removed. You know, and as a result, both of these products have been delayed to the first half of 2011. Both of them were supposed to ship by the end of this year oh, originally. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, yeah, so Windows Home Server Veil still doesn't have, we don't know the name of that yet. It still doesn't have a name, but uh, Small Business Server Aurora is now called Small Business Server 2011 Essentials. Um, but both are, you know, they're both now months away. So I think sometime in January, Microsoft is going to release a beta version of both of these products that no longer includes Drive Extender. Um, so people can test that. You know, I said to these guys, I said, you know, I just bought like eight terabytes of storage or whatever it is. And with the express purpose of duplicating all of the data on my server, and now at least half of that is going to be completely useless. I mean, I'm never going to, well, I shouldn't say never. But it will be quite some time before I'll need that much storage without duplication, right? That was the reason I bought it. So uh, I'm looking at uh, my Twitter stream. Brian John says, well, Veil will support RAID. So this is in Veil. Not, is that not, not the case? Veil will support RAID. Okay, so what? <laughs> well, at least you know, that Windows covers the, the, the redu it, redundancy It doesn't issue. really, though. See, the, no. the simplicity of Windows Home Server was literally you could buy a drive. Right. You could have five drives in your computer. You didn't have to All think completely about it. They don't, they're completely different sizes. It doesn't matter. I see. You just plug them in, you add them to the pool storage, and you go. With RAID... There are very specific oh, yeah, requirements yeah. around the configuration of the drive and all. Right. It's very complicated. This is where Drobo has an advantage over RAID. And so this was essentially right. a Drobo-like technology for Windows Home Server. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, but it went beyond what Drobo offers. And then had says. additional, had the pool yep. storage yep. and all that. So yep. I think Drobo is the closest. If you look at uh, just the, the, the storage technology in Windows Home Server and, and what was going to be in Essentials, um, yeah, Drobo is probably the closest. So... Drobo has come down in price a lot. Uh, Drobo works very well. I have one here, and it's it's awesome. I think, actually, they're clearing out the old uh, USB 2 Drobos. This is probably a good time if, if you don't need yeah, USB 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th that's certainly an option. And and, and really what you, what you come up with is something that is a little different than what we had in the past. So uh, I would say that for the first generation of Windows Home Server, and probably, again, for small business server essentials, that what you were looking at was a little tower-type system with a bunch of drives in it. Given the way they've changed the product, it almost makes more sense to have a little, um, you know, like a, an appliance type box, like a Mac mini type box with a single disc in it that has the system on it, but then have your storage be something else. Right. Um, Drobo or a NAS or whatever it might be. And you can uh, do that, right? You just plug it into the back of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, even with Drive Extender, you could use Drobo in that way if you wanted to. I mean, I, I don't know that you would mix and match them in such a way, but now that you're not going to have um, it's less know, convenient because you can't say, oh, well, there's some here and some there and some there. Right. But if the and Drobo's big enough, you just put it all on the Drobo, I guess. Yeah. Even with, right. So if Drobo is exposed to some kind of a drive letter under Veil, vale, um, I, I suppose theoretically you could, keep, you could keep extending that and that would extend the size of that drive letter and it solves that problem I talked about earlier, except that for that to work, you're buying another product too, right? So... And, well, just another problem. I think the additional cost is the cost of the Drobo. So, Which is you know, not Windows, insignificant, let's face it. No, no. And, uh, no, there's, there's no way to sugarcoat this. I mean, this is just bad news. You know, this Windows Home Server was awesome. And now it, I, we have to see it. it it's going to be pretty good or good at best. I mean, and it, that kind of stinks. I think 
a small business server and up, it's a little bit less of a problem um, because, because those products just didn't exist anyway. So they're adding it to something new. I mean, um, I think that, like you said, RAID or Drobo use or whatever it is, iSCSI even, is a little more common once you get up into the server market. But when we talk about a home product, right. you know, this thing went from being a very cool, very simple, single box, you know, appliance type computer to, eh, you know, a little more complicated, a little less easy to recommend. And, you know, I know uh, people who are into Windows Home Server are going to have to weigh the cost and benefit of, um, you know, NAS type products or something else instead. Which, which, you know, as you say, are more, I mean, I've been playing with a Synology NAS. I have a ready NAS. Um, yep. They're, they're easy, but not as easy as WHS was. I mean, WHS was just a no brainer. It just kind of worked like you thought it would work. It works so well you forgot it was there. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, I'm still using it today. So, I mean, as of today, I'm on the beta version of Veil, which has drive extenders still. They haven't stripped it out yet. It works fine. It works great. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I feel bad. I'm going to miss it. I mean, I I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, when when the new version, the new beta comes out without drive extender, obviously, I'm going to look at it and I'll evaluate it. But, you know, even for myself, I've, my infrastructure, I hate to use that word, you know, for a house, but the, my technology infrastructure, such as it is, has been on Windows Home Server since the original product was in beta, and I don't remember what year that was, but it's been several years. Um, but you've been one this, of the biggest proponents of it. I mean... Uh, yeah, this puts a big question mark, you know, on Home Server. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, it is too bad. And and it's for technical reasons. It's it's because of data potential data loss that they did this. I don't. I'm not. Yeah, there was a data integrity problem. Uh, it sounded a lot like that thing that occurred back on that right. original version of Windows Home Server. I'm not, uh, except that it really wasn't. Uh, the, if you recall the on the original version of Windows Home Server, the issue was that you were running an application on your PC, but you were accessing a document that was stored up on the server, and there was some sort of a if you save the document from your PC to that server while the document was live, you could actually corrupt it. It happened with well, photos yeah, that's and, not good. With and things like that. Uh, this has more to do with running applications that are working with data that run on the server. And there's something about the, uh, because of the way that it duplicates data, it's probably not instantaneous from a computer science standpoint. There's a, a delay of some yeah, sort. Yeah, there's some sort of delayed right. And I thought I, there was, and yeah. because of that, it's journaling or the something. data integrity was uh, compromised. And they, they just couldn't get it to work. The uh, so, Jeff N. in our chat room asks, then yep. what's your recommendation? Stick with version one <laughs> right. or uh, use Veil beta? Well, so... If you have the choice, if you have access to it. It's a tough one because I think people who listen to this, and Jeff probably is pretty technical, and there's yeah, nothing he, wrong with the current beta. And he's if you're a not, huge Veil fan. Yeah, if you're not running applications on it, I mean, it's going to be fine for now. But understand that it's also not going to be around forever and that at some point we're all going to have to move on. So looking forward, I would say, I'm going to obviously evaluate the next version. And if it's not going to meet my needs, I'm going to have to look and think about what I might be doing personally and what I will recommend to others as well. But the one thing I would just remind people, um, you know, we get caught up in this technology treadmill kind of thing. You know, we're always on the next beta. We're always looking at the next version. We're always very excited about what's coming down the pike and everything. But, you know, for most people, these products are standalone as they are, and they just work. You know, Windows Home Server, in many ways, if, if normal people are really using this in their houses, and I don't think there are that many of them, but if there are, you know, they should be treating it like a toaster or a DVD player. Right. You know, it just sits there. It doesn't stop working. You know, Windows Home Server 1.0 isn't going to magically disappear because Drive Extender has been removed from a future version. Um, that thing is essentially an appliance. You can continue to add storage to it. You can continue to duplicate your storage and, and use that, uh, you know, single drive uh, or storage pool and so forth. It will always work or will continue to work anyway. Um, you know, that doesn't change. But I... I think that, you know, for people in our industry, people who do what we do, um, you know, we always, we're always moving ahead. I mean, I, I tend to live on this stuff. So I am, like I said, I'm using the beta at, for my live data and it, and I just, that rhymed for some reason the way I said it, but, uh, <laughs> data for but, data, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm on the data beta, but, um, it works fine. Right. So for months down the road, I will, I'll, I'll continue on that, but, 
yeah, I'll be looking a little more toward maybe Veil plus Drobo or maybe I go to some kind of a NAS thing. Maybe I go back to Windows Server. You know, before I was on Windows Home Server, I was on just the regular version of Windows Server. And there are some storage technologies there that are kind of interesting. There's a uh, an Essentials version of the Storage Server product coming that's part of this family of Colorado servers, as they call them. Um, you know, there's a small business server version of Vail, Aurora, um, small business server essentials, which has domain support, which is kind of interesting. And, you know, I'll, I'll look at all that stuff and, and figure out what I'm going to do and, and what I would recommend, I guess, to other people. But we're going to have to wait and see what it looks like. You know, what strikes me is that it, it uh, part of this comes from the fact that we have an outdated, outdated file systems. I keep, yeah. I keep looking at ZFS, which was such a, a really fantastic Mm -hmm. uh, file system from Sun. I don't know. I'm sure it's dead now with Oracle. Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it's open source. You know what? This, this is always, uh, you got to remember when you talk about Microsoft, it's always about backwards compatibility. Right. They can't go Microsoft, to, a, they can't make this major jump. They couldn't make WinFS happen in Longhorn or Windows Vista. They couldn't make this happen now. And I mean, here we are years and years and years down the road. You can find the, the documents that, you know, Jim Alchin and the other guys at Microsoft signed off in, in the mid 1990s where they talked about Object-oriented file systems. Right. Longhorn was going to have that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, they've been talking about this forever. But what it always comes down to, and the reason that this thing was just killed, as beautiful as it was, is compatibility. Right. You know, you right. can't. Uh, if you introduce a great new feature that kills this other thing that's really important, something has to give. And in this case, as is so often the case, Microsoft decided that the compatibility was more important than this kind of yep. forward-leaning functionality. Yep. That stinks. You know if. But if it happens. You, that's that's Microsoft in a nutshell. Yeah. And if you're in big, business, you think that's great. Yep. But I'm not in business, and I, <laughs> you know, right. I want to share media, and I want it to be duplicated, and uh, all that stuff. And I, for me, why this has to be killed from Windows Home Server is unclear to me. But there it goes. We're going to take a break while Paul cries into his beer. Or coffee, or large glass of water. I, I maybe could be gin. I don't know. Uh, Trump. <laughs> vodka. You take it straight from the tap. <laughs> uh, and come back with more. There's lots more to talk about. You're listening to Windows Weekly, a uh, special early in the week edition for Thanksgiving week. Before we go too much farther, I'd like to say hello, a howdy, a boy howdy to our friends at Citrix who do such a great deal. Uh, with uh, remote access. One of the best, I think, is go to Assist Express. This is a remote access for support professionals. So you can, and I know a lot of people use remote access to do support, but this has some nice features. For instance, you don't have to have, uh, your end user has to have anything installed or anything. You, could, you, you, could, you can walk them through it or just send them a link, and it's really like a 30-second to a minute install, and suddenly you're in the system. And now, from now on, you can do things like unattended support. You can have eight sessions at once. I, just that by itself should sell you on that. How many times have you started a scan or an install, and then you wait? You sing that uh, girl from Ipanema song. In, in, in this way, you just go to the next one, next one. You can do eight sessions at once. Uh, it gives you, here's another great feature. It gives you a survey of uh, the operating system, what's running in the background, and so forth. Support Macs from PCs, PCs from Macs. It's, it's cross-platform. It's 128-bit SSL, so it's secure even if your client is in a coffee shop or if you are. You know, sometimes that happens. You get that call. You're in a coffee shop. You don't want to get up. You don't want to leave your double frappuccino mocha latte. You want to solve the problem, and you can with GoToAssist Express. Try it free right now for 30 days. 30 mm -hmm. days free, you'll get an idea of what you could do with it. Go to assist.com slash windows. Maybe you plan to take a little time off for the holidays, and you know they're going to call from work saying, I can't, the printer's not working. Now's the time to put this on your laptop. Go to assist.com slash windows. We thank Citrix for their support of Windows Weekly. You, I quoted you on the radio show, Paul, and, uh, and, uh, and on uh, several other shows because you had that great screenshot of... Windows 1.01. 1 .01. Oh, yeah, yeah. 25th anniversary this week. Yep. Now, nobody used Windows 1. No, not even Microsoft. <laughs> it I'm was horrible. Kidding. I, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> I, t I mentioned it to Kevin Rose on Twitter this week, and he said, you know, I had, remember I had that shrink-wrapped in-the-box copy? Never yep. opened. I donated it. It's now on loan to the Computer History Museum. And, in nice. fact, it says... You know, courtesy Kevin Rose. <laughs> They've ne nobody's ever opened it. I said, Kevin, no. it could be like one of those bad bottles of wine. You open it up and the 
There's a Mickey Mouse coupon inside. He said, I can tell you this. It's not going to get better with age. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying, dude. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, you know, I wrote an article about this, and I kind of looked at it from my own perspective. The one bit of the story I didn't really tell in there was that, you know, and, and few people understand this, um, Windows was many things. I mean, obviously, at the time, it was an extension to DOS. Uh, it was literally like one of those file extender type things. And uh, Yeah, I mean, it was like a shell. A shell on top of DOS, yeah. yeah. Um, Microsoft colluded with IBM to come out with OS2. And OS2 was named because it was the next OS, right? It was the OS that was going to follow DOS. And Microsoft's plan was to get rid of Windows. You know, Windows was just a stepping stone. And they, they literally wound down Windows internally <laughs> and were working full, full bore on OS2. I'm serious. And by the way, this was the same time period where... Oh, God. Uh, Microsoft's uh, CEO at the time, co-founder Bill Gates, went to Apple and and offered them, you make the OS, we already have all these partners signed up, they're going to make your computers, just like we do in the PC space, right. but it's going to be running Mac OS. That and was Apple their model no. with DOS, really, is we don't need to, we don't really need to do, we just license. <laughs> yeah, so uh, M Microsoft offered this to Apple, and wow. they turned it down. They said but the no. thing that the thing that kept Windows going... And I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember the names of the two guys that did it, but there were basically a couple of guys within Microsoft who kept working away at it on their own, kind of in a skunk works kind of a thing, um, by themselves. And at some point, it was literally on the verge of, I think, the release of the first OS2. They showed what they did, I think, to Steve Ballmer, or maybe it was uh, Bill Gates at the time, I don't recall, but and said, we figured it out. We, we crossed that technical divide. We... We were able to do the stuff that we, you know, didn't think was going to be possible in Windows, and we could make this work on our own. Wow. And when they saw what they had accomplished, they said, let's do it. And Windows started back up again. And, of course, for a couple of years, secretly, Microsoft was working on this thing and pushing it. And, of course, in, Microsoft would have these uh, meetings with IBM where the IBM guys were saying, what's going on with this Windows thing? It looks just like OS2. OS2. It has the same UI. I thought you were giving up on that. And, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. You're still the... You know, the premier partner and, you, you know, we're pushing everyone to OS2 and, you know, the history is what it is. You know, today OS2 is gone and Windows has been, you know, on the top of the heap for, I would say, at least 15 years now. Um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting little bit of story, you know, because uh, Windows was a joke. <laughs> you know, I mean, those, those first versions of Windows were horrible. And I remember mocking Windows and Microsoft in general, you know, in the 1980s. I mean, I was never impressed by their products at all as a, an Amiga user and a, briefly as an Apple user, which was, a, in my case, a, a horrible mistake. Um, but there were other systems. The Mac is one of the obvious ones, but not just the Mac. You know, things like the Atari ST and the Commodore Amiga, um, other graphical systems that were so much more advanced for so long, you know, um, before Windows finally caught up. And it it's, wasn't until... It's funny to see 101. It looks just like um, Jam. Yeah. Or something, you know? Yeah, because right, because that's exactly what it was. I mean, right. it was just it was a shell. You know, it's it's a it's it's like a, I don't know what you call that kind of graphics, but it's like DOS graphics, you yeah. know? Six, well, They're it's very, sixteen very, color. Very yeah, it's, it's very limited, very low resolution, and and really, uh, in their defense, it was a lack of hardware. I mean, you 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 what they were doing in minimum RAM and and minimum mm -hmm. processor speed and the dis graphics displays. I mean, they were sixteen color. They were you know I don't know what. <laughs> 1024. Yeah. No, no, I mean, like 800 it, by 600. Type of, right. It's the type of steady improvement that doesn't really happen anymore because the headroom is so big now right. on software hardware that this, you know, it, we're not going to exceed the capabilities of hardware anytime soon. But they knew back then when they were developing it, look, this computer is going to be twice as fast a year from now. And it's going to be twice as fast again a year from then. Uh, we'll get there. And, you know, the Microsoft software, this is an odd thing to say, but it was always kind of ahead of the curve, if you will. Um, that it would, it, this will run great on on hardware a year from now, but it's not going to run great now. And lots of disk swapping. You know, this thing was designed for five and a quarter inch disks and very low memory systems. You know, 640K, if I'm not mistaken, was actually the maximum for a while there before we had expanded. No one extent. will ever need more. I don't think he actually said that. No, he says he never said that. Yeah. And 640K. But whatever. Sure. Sure. Hey, I just said I'm not going to need more than eight terabytes of storage. You know, yeah, exactly. Sure. We say that all the time. I don't. I, you know. <laughs> even if he said it, it's not. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's completely it's credible. Just, I mean, who knew? Sure. We didn't sure. know. When confronted with new information, <clears throat> yes, I, I story must, must often revise. changes.
Um, did you use Desk View or any of those other uh, DOS task switchers? No, Never. so I wasn't an IBM, you know, oh, PC you kind of guy. You weren't a DOS guy. So oh, okay. I, to me, these things were ludicrous. Even, even on the Commodore 64 or 128, there were systems like GEOS, you know, that were right. actually pretty decent Mac clones for the day. I mean, given the incredible memory limitations, I think a, a Commodore 64 had something like 38K of usable RAM or something with <laughs> the system. But no, I'm serious. It was ridiculous. No, I know. It started and, it was 64 because it started with 64K. But, yeah. there, but, there, but that wasn't all free. No, no, not even close. And, you know, the systems were so limited in that day. But I was always fascinated first by the 16-bit computers, you know, the Ataris and the Commodores of the world, you know, the Amiga and so forth. Uh, the Macintosh, of course, was always fascinating, um, but expensive, you know. And I remember, um, in my case, uh, we had a couple of, you know, notable things that I went through. I, I went through a, probably a two-year span where I had an Apple IIgs, GS, uh, which was a horrible, expensive waste of time and money. Um, and then finally went back, you know, went to the Amiga after that. But, you know, my wife had an, I, an IBM PS1. And I remember installing an early version of Windows on that and just, I mean, aside from the performance, which was laughable, you could literally watch the thing draw, you know, in real time. It was crazy. Right. Um, it was so horrible, you know, it was just, I did, I, I couldn't, it, it's like to watch this thing take off and become popular was like a slap to the face. It didn't make any sense to me. You know, it was just technologically so ludicrous, uh, compared to the other stuff. Well, that imagine how Apple felt because in, right. in 84, they come with a OS, uh, uh Mac OS, what sure. they call it system. Well, seven. Mac, I would say the only thing I would say about that is obviously from a usability perspective, the Mac was incredible. I think from a technological perspective, especially the early versions. It was hardware not, constrained like everybody else. They, you know, they, yeah, yeah. When you push the limit that hard, um, yeah, to, to what was available hardware-wise. But, you know, I would say by the early, you know, late 1980s, early 1990s, I mean, between the Amiga, especially in my case, or, uh, you know, the Mac. With, you know, Mac obviously went color at some point and, and very high resolution and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, to me, I just didn't understand it. You know, I, I, I didn't get why. Um, that would happen. Even in the PC space, there was never, it was never obvious that MS-DOS at first or Windows was the choice. You know, it, it always seemed like some version of Unix was going to happen on the desktop. It, you know, there was coherent Unix and um, some of those early Unix-like OSs, you know, way before Linux. I mean, some of the, uh, I guess it would have been proprietary Unix or whatever. Like however. Unix. There was a lot. Of, yeah, there were yeah. choices out there. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, anything could have happened. You know, CPM should have made the transition uh, and become very successful instead of DOS, but it didn't. Um, you know, there was a Pascal-based OS of sorts, mm -hmm. uh, for the original mm -hmm. IBM. I just, it, the way this whole thing happened was just so bizarre to me. Well, serendipity. I mean, it's just, and, and you know, you yeah. give credit to Bill, Gray, Bill Gates. Yep. Uh, I think really he has a, a, a lot of business acumen, and I think that that was... Yeah, you know, more it, than people realize. Yeah, yeah if it, you know, it turns out that... Uh, Technical chops aren't what make a product. What Jobs and Gates both have is the ability to take a technical product and make it a real product, a consumer product. And that's, yeah. what, that's what he did with Windows. And, you know, many people looked at it technically and said, well, come on. But he productized it. He's a brilliant, right. he's a right. brilliant, brilliant And actually man. for a technologist such as Gates... He should have been embarrassed by what he was yeah. offering, yeah. Uh, but he just pushed ahead with it. You I know, and I, I guess you give him credit for that. I, they I, were doing the best they could with the hardware they had. I sure. Think. I held out as long as I could on the PC. I really did. And obviously, when the Amiga failed, uh, I think we talked about this. Oh maybe. man, people still That's, are crying over that. Well, I still am too. That thing, you know, the <laughs> the Amiga intellectual property was pushed from company to company like it was an unwanted stepchild. It was it was so awful to see that happen. Oh, and, and, I, I and blame just the Tremels. I blame the Commodore folks. They just really, they yeah. They, Gateway screwed them over. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a lot of horrible stuff that happened there, and years went by and it just became irrelevant. So that was that was that. But you know, by the mid 1990s, there were Amiga guys looking at OS2, which I cautioned against. Um, I looked at things like Windows, which I thought was terrible. Windows for work groups was a little bit interesting because of the networking stuff and actually some of the 32-bit capabilities that. Some people didn't realize we're in there. But it wasn't until I saw Windows 95, you know, uh, where I thought, okay, this this is something that I can really rally around. I mean, this is actually pretty good. Well, you know, and I think Steve Jobs said to me, uh, 
this was Apple's big mistake. Apple got complacent after 1984, and he said, we let Microsoft catch up. He said, by Windows 3, yeah. they had caught up. And, and well, I think it's, it's hard that. to understand what he means by that. So I would say from a usability standpoint, that's not true. But maybe from a technical standpoint, you know. They were close they, enough. You could certainly say by 95 they caught up. Well, 95, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, 95, they, they that eliminated. That was 10 years later. 10 years later, they caught up. And, and that's what yeah. he was basically saying is you, we had a 10-year lead, but sure. we squandered it. The problem was by that point, not only had they, I would say they caught up from a usability standpoint. Uh, Windows 95, you know, we didn't understand it at the time. Windows 95 wasn't so technically pure as we <laughs> would have liked. It was but, still a shell. Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much. But still, I, from a usability perspective, I think that was the area where the Mac really made a big difference. Um, you know, Windows 95 caught up. It had long file names. You know, it had right. folders and, and, and a nice desktop. And right. it, was, it was nice. Um, that was the first time I thought, okay, this is something that, you know, can take the mantle and run with it. You know, I thought that was something I could recommend to people. It was good. I mean, I never thought I'd, I, it's weird. I'm like the Windows guy, but you know, it really wasn't until about 1994, you know, where I thought, okay. And I kind of went into it kicking and screaming. I mean, I, I really had no interest in this aspect of the technological world, you know? I mean, I, uh, I, never, I never respected any of the early Microsoft stuff at all. Um, and I still don't. I mean, I look back on the Windows 3.0 stuff and earlier, and I think, this is a joke. You've got to be kidding me. Um, but that's, you know, that's what's sold. And it's, it's, it's so weird, but... Um, obviously the stuff we have today is pretty good and, and, and very good in many cases. Um, it's a different world, but and there's stuff like NT. I mean, I think NT is the point where I really embrace the Microsoft stuff and they proved to me that, um, stuff could be different. Although they've spent the past decade, you know, just destroying that <laughs> as well, you know, um, but in the sense that, you know, they did things like add IE, uh, to the end, the core of NT, which I, mean, I think forever. Right. surrendered any security and, and technological leadership they could have claimed previous to that. Um, but they, you know, uh, interesting stuff. And I think that Microsoft, you know, looking ahead, uh, you know, maybe they can make this transition to the cloud computing stuff. And I think they will. I'm curious to see how it goes with Windows, because I think there are some serious concerns on the low end, especially, which is going to become the volume end of the market from devices, not just the iPad, but from mobile devices, you know, that, run on much simpler foundations that are custom designed for the hardware types that, you know, these platforms are made out of. And that Windows has been very malleable in the past, but it remains to be seen whether they can make this transition. But then again, you know, like I said, this is a system that was on death's doorstop and it, you know, it spent the next decade and a half just dominating the world. So I suppose anything could happen. Let's take a you're break. A, <laughs> My turn. <laughs> I was going to say, you're, you're a Windows lover. What do you have to say? <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with Windows. I, I, I think, um, you know, I was an early DOS user. I was a CPM yep. user. I guess my first computer was an Atari, but I used CPM, and then I used DOS. Pip. Pip. Yeah, I, uh, I got very uh, comfortable. Yeah, Pip. <laughs> I forgot about Pip. I got very comfortable with... <laughs> That was basically copy, right? That's how you copied stuff in DOS. Copy, yeah. I mean, it's CBM. You'd call it. Pip. I don't know why I was called Pip. Pip. You wouldn't copy. You'd pip it. Maybe it only could handle three letter <laughs> file so names. Stupid. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, and DOS, uh, I knew, you know, I, I, I could write batch files like nobody's business, and I had all the menuing things and all that stuff. And uh, sure, I think uh, I kind of my eyes opened when I saw the first Lisa. Yeah, couldn't afford it when OS no, when the Mac no, Mac came out. I I bought it even though I couldn't afford it because it was at least cheaper than a Lisa. And uh, I never I didn't have like you. I had very little respect for Windows. I'll tell you when I re do remember vividly seeing mm -hmm. Windows three O and saying, "Wow, this isn't that bad." Really? <laughs> yeah. The one thing I, I, I the one thing I really liked about Windows compared to the Amiga was high high resolution for the day. Yeah. You know, on, on a low end Amiga. I which was essentially hooked up to a TV. You were looking at 640 right. by 200 right. resolution. You could have VGA and SVGA, right? 800 by 600 was like, whoa, you know. Uh, you couldn't do a lot with it. I think it was 16 color at the time, but it was, you know, it was high res. I think essentially that's what happened to me. Was, uh, it, it, was, it was the aesthetic appeal of it. 
Yeah. Uh, I thought, oh, it's pretty. It's got. It, it's there. I was comfortable with the command line. In fact, one of the reasons I still use OS X is because it has a Unix command line, and I spent a lot of time in the command line. So it wow. wasn't. Well, I then think that's my DOS heritage. I I don't I yeah. don't mind it. I like it. I like being able to type a command. I always saw that as the the problem. You know that this is this is what's going to keep. Oh no! People. It's not the problem. It's the solution. <laughs> okay. It's the thing that makes it so good. Last night I was uh, I was compiling software. I just love that. You know, as make. I had a. I, you know, I just reminded make, me. Make compile. You were talking about the batch command make thing uh, in the early '90s when my wife had that IBM computer and I had a an Amiga. You know, she came to me one time and she said, "I can't start WordPerfect." You know, and so I I don't have any idea how to use an IBM computer, but I sat down in front of it and I typed in WP and WordPerfect started up, and I said, "I don't understand what the problem is." And she's like, well, it wouldn't, uh, you know, wherever she was in the file system, she typed that and it didn't, didn't work. Didn't do anything. Yeah, she was I said, well, you understand that. how to go back to the you know, place and type in the command. And she had no idea what I was talking about. Right. But she had been using WordPerfect for years for work. Isn't that interesting? So I wrote a, a batch program. I guess you would call it like a batch command. What were those called? I don't even know. Like a script. We call it a script yeah, file. Script. Batch, bat, bat file. Batch, yeah. The bat file. Yeah. That presented a menu. That had all the programs she would want to run, and um, yeah. you know do this, do all the correct. I spent CD a lot of time things. doing that. Yeah, use those DOS graphics to make yeah. the lines. And, yeah, 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 yeah. So, years later, and I gave this out to a couple of friends. You know, um, years later, I'm in Phoenix, and a friend of mine turns on his computer, and what comes up is my menu <laughs> on the front of the you know on his computer, and I said, what, "Where'd you get that? Where did you get that?" And he bought a computer from another friend of ours back in Massachusetts who was selling computers With using your my menu system. Bible, and he would custom make it for whatever wow. programs they wanted installed. I probably so had he, it too. I can maybe. <laughs> it I mean, spread everywhere. You know, I'm not saying it was, you know, important intellectual property, <laughs> but it was my first um, maybe instance of seeing my stuff copied. I think that's you know, great. It was, it was a weird experience, yeah. you know. It, yeah. it should have made you feel good. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, see, there's a difference. See, you're that's the, you're a closed source guy. You're not an open source. Uh, yeah, guy. maybe maybe I am. I, I well, I I would say too. I mean, uh, one of the big challenges that Microsoft still sort of is pushed back is this Linux thing. You know, and I remember being at in again in Phoenix at Scottsdale Community College, looking at this Linux thing. You know, as, as Slackware Linux at the time, which was distributed on crazy floppies. You know, they had all of those right. different lettered and numbered floppies. And thinking, this is it. You know, this is it. This is the future. There's no way Microsoft can stop this. It's free. Right. You know, eventually, this thing is going to catch up. And then how do, how do they stop it? You know? And uh, I still, <laughs> I'm not even sure I could explain how they stopped it. Because, well, obviously, I, I mean, I think Windows is did better. Did you ever but, try to install Slackware? <laughs> yes, many, many times. I've spent a lot I, of time. Me too. Converts. And I don't think I ever got it running. <clears throat> yeah, I got it running. But, you know, the tough thing about Linux was in the early days was always... Getting the X you know, getting um, uh, graphic, the graphics running. I'm yep. trying um, X zoning. window. Yeah, X window. Yeah, it was very. Yep, because you would script that little fun. file, and then That's you were it. done. Yeah, <laughs> XF yeah. could fig. Yeah, I yep. remember that. Yep, it screwed up, and then the, it would, you're yeah. dead. That was it. So, uh, when is the book Paul Thorat's Batch File Secrets coming out? Right, I couldn't write a batch file enough. My life depended <laughs> on it. You remembered Pip. I remember weird things. I have dementia. <laughs> that you know, I hadn't thought about Pip in twenty, it's like, 20 um, years. Computer Tourette's. Yeah, Pip. Pip. <laughs> and I think you had to do it backwards too. It was completely uh, non-intuitive. Oh, command. it's just the stupidest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, let's take a little time out here. We're gonna talk a little bit about my good friends at Carbonite. We come a long way, baby. Long way, baby, from those days. Carbonite Pro. Do you guys want to take off? Or are you getting a little bored? No, we have to get in the trailer and head south. They have to get in the trailer and go to Pismo Beach. So we're, we're going to say uh, so long okay. to our to our uh, studio audience, Ken Anderson and his wife Janice. Janice, I guess, won all her Scrabble games, so they're out of here. 400 points. Do you had a 400-point game? Very nice. Nice to meet you, Ken. Oh, I hate people like that. I don't play Scrabble with them. See you later. Well, nice to meet you. Thank you, Janice. Take care. See you later, Ken. Happy Thanksgiving. I scared them, didn't I? Yeah, you chased them right out. Uh, thank you. Take care. Happy Thanksgiving, too.
She's saying happy Thanksgiving, Paul. Oh, thank you. You know what Thanks. I'm thankful for? No. Our sponsors. <laughs> hey, you ought to be too, because without them, we got nothing. You who who pays for all this stuff? That's what I ask every time I come in here. I had how many employees? Who's paying for this stuff? <laughs> Carbonite is that's who. Carbonite Pro, you know, and actually, I say this about all our sponsors. We handpick our sponsors. I turn down people all the time who want to advertise. I only do ads for people who I use, whose products I believe in. And we only do a handful of ads and a handful of advertisers for that reason. But um, if you happen to need the product they sell and you use it, I really appreciate it. Because, and so do they, because that's really how this all gets funded. Carbonite is a very good example. I found Carbonite. I met David Friend, the guy who, he was, uh, he, he actually, very cool guy. Um, early entrepreneur. He started the, uh, synthes the ARP synthesizer company right out of college. And uh, he is, you know, as, as happens, he aged. His kids grew up, went to college. His daughter called him one night and said, Daddy, <laughs> I've lost my thesis. Help me. And he said, there's got to be a better form of backup. Actually, in her case, in my daughter's case, probably any form of backup would be good. So he came up with Carbonite. The idea being it's automatic. So, you know, I put it on my daughter's. It's kind of ironic. Here we are a few years later. I put it on my daughter's computer heading off to college. So she doesn't have to think about it. Whenever she's online anywhere uh and the the backups are happening and with 128 bit, bit ssl she doesn't have to worry about the security and you know, open access spot it just it just does it that's kind of cool she's carrying around her laptop now let me tell you laptops get stolen they get lost hard drives die pretty much guaranteed before the end of the year something's going to happen to her data but i can say to her no problem honey go to the library log in there to your carbonite account and your data is safe there's an iphone app free blackberry app free you can get your data from anywhere this is such a good idea such a good product that a lot of small businesses started using it and and carbonite found out and said wait a minute <laughs> we could do this a little bit better for small business for instance one account multiple computers you pay not for the number of users but for the purely for the amount of data which is really what business wants and it starts at ten dollars a month so if that's for that's for i think for 20 gigabytes so 10 users two gigs each that's a reasonable amount i think for business especially, that's $10 a month. It's automatic. It's encrypted. You can add further triple desk or blowfish encryption if you want to keep it absolutely secure. And it's backed up to the cloud. Or of course, Carbonite has a network operations center, and you know they're constantly backing up that data. So it's really safe as can be. No matter what happens, your business can get back up online running instantly with Carbonite Pro. I want you to try it free for 30 days. Go to CarbonitePro.com. If you're an IT person, if you're a small business owner, if you're a sole proprietor like me, this is a godsend. You don't have to think about it. You just put it on the computers and it works. Your users can even restore files if they accidentally delete them, things like that. CarbonitePro.com. We thank them for their support of Windows Weekly, and we encourage you to give them and all our sponsors a little try. So I've been playing with the Connect. I was really pleased... Um, Last yep. night, I came home, and the, the coffee table was moved out of the way in the living room, and that's a sure sign. And I said, honey, what's going on? She said, uh, Henry had some friends over. They were doing Dance Central. That's a good sign. You got your, you got your teenagers playing it. Yep. And now I'm seeing there's, in fact, there's a web page, Connect Hacks web page. People are hacking this thing like crazy. <clears throat> was this right. Microsoft's intention, or is this well, against their better interest? Yeah, they say that it was their original intention, but the... You know the kind of the story here, such as it is, is that they allegedly originally said that, that this is not what they wanted, and that they would pursue these people. Um, and then they supposedly laid a reverse course, which is actually not what happened at all. You know, so <laughs> this is one of my big pet peeves. You know, uh, reporting on news for as long as I have, I see the headlines, and I see the you know everyone uses the same phrase. You know, Microsoft backpedaled on Connect. You know, so I went and looked at what they said. They, they haven't backpedaled at all. They, they, what they originally said was that Microsoft does not condone modification of its products, which means someone going in and changing the hardware so that it does something else. Microsoft will continue to make advances in, in the safeguards and, and prevent product tampering. So no one has done this. What people have done is written open source drivers so you can use Connect with Linux. So when asked to comment on that, Microsoft said, well, that... Connect wasn't hacked. We left the USB port open. It's there's no problem with this. And now everyone's saying they're backpedaling because originally they said they were going to go after people who hacked the Connect. But what they were talking about was product tampering. 
So uh, the, the Connect is open. You can plug it into anything. It says USB port. So if you wanted to write a driver for Windows or for the Mac or for Linux or for the Sony, which I hear could use a decent motion <laughs> sensing uh, add-on, um, you could do so. So you're open. You're, you're free to do that. So I think that's the big story. You know, is the story within the story is just you can look this up. Everyone has reported on it in exactly the same way. You know, Microsoft backpedaled on their stance on uh, Connect hacking uh, when, in fact, they have not. So I think that's cool. I, I think it shows um, how popular this thing is. You know, the, the guys who would write open source anything are not Microsoft fans, obviously, but yet they're still kind of pumped about the Connect. Oh, yeah. So. Well, it's a low cost infrared and camera connection that really has a lot of utility. I it's think crazy how much it does, yeah. If you, I mean, if, if you think about it, it's in Microsoft's interest that they let this community play with it because they're going to come up yep. with some great ideas. I, if I were Microsoft, I'd say, have at it. I bet you that the language they use is carefully crafted to protect them from liability. Yes, yes. And that and, they and really I, secretly say, go, go, we want to see what happens. The one thing I'll say, though, is obviously, and we've talked about this, Microsoft intends for the technology behind Connect to appear elsewhere, you know, future versions yeah, of Windows. Windows so 8 maybe, yeah. There's just one problem, though, with the current Connect, and that's that it's really optimized for a distance of six to eight feet from the camera to be used effectively. Right. In fact, it'll not... tell you when you're playing the game, get closer, get farther. That's why we have to move yeah. the coffee table. <laughs> right. You, uh, people are really, uh, right, re moving things around. We've, you have we've had to, to rearrange we your living room. use it as an angle, you know, at an angle. So yeah, me too. Enough... Because <laughs> uh, there's no way we can't stand in but front of it. But it's really great because it says, it, it shows you on the screen, it says get uh, right there. Yeah, yeah. perfect. <laughs> and then, but I'm standing on the couch. Don't move. <laughs> Don't move. Now, I think so, what Microsoft is worried about is, <laughs> have you seen Connect, ConnectHacks.net? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Now, here's, I think this is something um, that, uh, this is safe for work. Da, uh, mm -hmm. The name isn't, but, uh, but the product is Dan Wilcox Hacked Connect to Detect Man boobs, <laughs> and when it detects man boobs, well, I'll show you what happens. It uh, it protects you. I won't get, I won't say the name of it because it's kind of uh, roughly. Uh, yes. The, yes. So here here he is. Now he's going to take off his shirt. He's at his MIT lab. Now I think he's a good looking fellow, but apparently the connect says, <laughs> "No, you need a brazier," <laughs> and that and that's the gesture with his hand. He can no, change it. Right, 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 right. That is a hack. Isn't that hysterical? That's good. That shows you what you could do. I mean, it's not perfect. <laughs> if you if you haven't seen this video, go to connecthacks.net. He's got the little coconut bra, the little girly bra. He's looks pretty. He's looking pretty smug right now. Tires. <laughs> good so there's gonna be a lot of stuff like this yes. you know? and i think it's i think it's neat i think, I think it's really that's, neat <laughs> that's it's totally amazing people what people are doing with this thing it's just incredible but this shows you what a big deal this really is right yeah i mean this has happened this is sporadically exploded overnight you know i, I just i think it's fantastic yeah, yeah. very 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 interesting yeah Moving along, Google uh, announces, and I think this is exciting. And if I if I could only get in on the beta, I would. That yeah. they, uh, you know, they bought the pro the company that did this. And I had rec I had I, I, when I found this, it was uh, DocuVerse or something, right? DocVerse, yeah. DocVerse. When I found DocVerse, I did the same thing. I actually tried it. I flipped my lid. I said, "This is great." I gave yeah. it to Lisa because she says I don't want to use Google Spreadsheet. It's not good. I want to use Excel. Right. And uh, but we want to use Google Apps. And uh, I said, Lisa, look, 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 you use Excel and it's like Google Apps is. So they bought the company and now this yeah. is, they are renamed it Cloud Connect. And and but it's only in beta right now in private closed. beta. And unfortunately, unfortunately, they closed it because yeah. so many people signed up. You know, Google is discovering that uh, they have uh, we've talked about this. You know, they have viable alternatives to exchange, especially, I would say, in SharePoint on the server side, on the cloud side, I guess. Uh, but what they don't have is a decent client, you know, productivity package like Office. People want Microsoft Office. It just works better. And this is genius, uh, uh, although it requires you to have a Microsoft product. So I guess if you're, you know, from Google's perspective, it's kind of a mixed kind of thing. But No, I think Google's got to be happy. 
Google. Well, it buys them time. It buys them time. In other words, I don't think Google you're... wants to put Microsoft out of business. I don't think that they're. They, I don't oh, think I, they care about I, that. I think they do. Really? <laughs> but no. But I think the the big the big thing here is it lets users use the tools they want. It lets people or companies, small businesses especially, move forward to the Google Apps, Google right. Docs. Or, right. Sorry, it's good for everybody. Gmail, Google Calendar stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's good for everyone. But I think in the in the background, what Google wants is what they want is you to migrate right from Office to whatever they have, Google Docs. And I think Google Docs has a lot of maturing to do before that can happen, if ever. You know, I think uh, it's more likely that my that Google just wants you to stop using Exchange. I yes. think they're probably very happy for you to use any apps you want as long as you. Well, for now, I mean, if they can get people off of Exchange, obviously the next step is get them off of Office. Mm -hmm. off, Office is that's not going to that's not going to. There's be something easy. like 750 million people using yeah, Office. That's right not going to happen. Yeah, I think. Google well, not, it's not going to happen today. But this right. is the point. In other words, this is a step, and this removes one of those roadblocks. Sure. Um, for their stuff, which is interesting. Plus, you know, Microsoft just announced uh, Office 365, and I've been you know testing that for the past week or so. And that gives you that look at a pure Microsoft stack cloud computing solution, including full versions of Office on a subscription basis, right? Um, so here we have the alternative, you know, Google, I guess it would be Google Apps plus this dock first technology, Cloud Connect. So you can use Microsoft Office on the desktop if you want. But then you get the advantages of the Google Doc stuff on the back end. You know, the ability to edit it from anywhere, including on devices. Mm -hmm. Uh, Non-Microsoft PCs and so forth. So, yeah, you know, I, I like I said, I, I don't, I don't like Google Docs. But then again, using Google Storage to hold Microsoft Docs, eh, it's not too bad. That's interesting, you know. Uh, Microsoft doesn't. Well, Microsoft has a consumer-oriented storage service in the cloud, obviously. But as far as SharePoint goes, there's no free version of SharePoint anywhere. And Google offers essentially what is their free version of SharePoint to the world. So this is a nice way to in interact with it using Microsoft Office, which is something you can do at SharePoint. But again, you have to pay for that. So interesting. I think this is an interesting thing. So I wish it was a more broadly available. I, by the time I heard about this, it was already too late. Does not work with uh, Office 2011 on the Mac, just with Office PC. Yeah, but it does work with 2003, 2007, and 2010 on the PC. Pretty cool. They'll, they'll, make, they'll make it work with, I'm sure, with Mac yeah, Office. Yeah. I, I think this is a great product. Yeah, I think a lot of the people using the Google stuff are using Macs, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I right. think there's probably a natural nexus of the two. Yep. Because we're hippies. Well, and you don't like Microsoft. We don't like so, Microsoft. We don't like fiscal. Listen, if you're still, you know, if you're still pissed off about DOS, all I'm saying is it's been like <laughs> 15 years. You know DR I mean? DOS was so much better. <laughs> TR DOS was better. The market does not decide. It's an often often thought that the market decides, and uh, you know, better technology wins. Never. Mm -mm. Very no, I don't. Very rare. Better technology almost never wins. Almost always loses. Yeah. Just look at BOS. No, that's another one. I, and speaking of that time period where we were looking at different things, BOS was like a return to the oh, here's the Amiga for the you know then right. current day. Loved it. Um, yeah. Loved it. Too bad. Too bad. Ah, well, now a little FUD. Microsoft hints. <laughs> well, okay, it's, come I mean, on. Hey, that's, Microsoft that's a very says, harsh hey, assessment, sir. You know, you, you know, Windows Phone 7 could be on tablets, too, you know. It could. They, I, they actually didn't say it like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it could, you know. <laughs> we have been, we, we mean, could make you tablets, know. you know. Technology watchers, the, those in the know. Uh, look at something like Windows Phone, and they think, wow, this is something that would be really cool on a tablet. And there's a lot of tablet stuff going on now, right, between the BlackBerry Playbook or whatever they're calling that, and the, there's a Dell uh, Netbook-type tablet that's coming out soon that actually looks pretty interesting, I have to say. Um, What's that going to be on, Windows 7? Yeah, Windows 7. It looks like that old Clio uh, uh, device with, you know, it's got the rod sticking up on it. Oh, and I love the Clio. I miss the Clio. Yeah, yeah. I think it's called the Latitude 200. You should look this up. It looks really cool. Latitude 200, okay. But, you know, the problem, I mean, one of the many problems with the iPad type stuff is that, you know, they, Apple in that case essentially took their iPhone OS and they just stretched it out times four and they made a few concessions to the screen size, but not a lot. And it, there are some weird usability issues when you're on a big screen like that. For example, on the iPad, and you know, just to beat on the iPad because I could do this all day long. You know, there's no hardware back button. So there's always a software back button. 
And that's way up in the, up, usually it's up in the upper left of the screen, although it could be anywhere because that's how it works in iOS. But a lot of the other buttons will be down at the bottom. And it creates this weird stretchy kind of a thing where you have to do, you know, use two hands and move around a lot. And there's a, there's a, just a form factor thing, you know, where if, if the system had been designed for that form factor to begin with, it would have been a completely different looking thing. Windows Phone OS is something that looks like it could work really well on a tablet, so much so that it's hard to imagine they designed this thing without thinking that. I mean, but they've always denied it. So very recently, um, when asked about this, and asked about Microsoft's uh, not so great reaction to the iPad this year. He said uh, that you're going to see some things we're going to do over the next year. He said you're going to see some stuff now at Christmas. You're going to see some stuff uh, with the new Intel chips that we've talked about in 2011. Uh, and then he said you're going to see some things as you move Windows Phone along. And it was the first time ever that anyone from Microsoft, and he is the CEO, uh, on the other hand, he also has a, a history about you know <laughs> speaking outside of the box or whatever. Uh, but Someone from Microsoft finally said Windows Phone in tandem with tablets. And it so, makes perfect sense. I mean, I, a tablet so requires much. a touch OS. Yep, I hope it happens. But Windows Phone I, does seem somewhat tied to a portrait mode architecture. That hub, I don't know how that would work. Well, in a, but what? that, you know, those hubs spread out over multiple screens. Mm. Now put the tablet there and you have them all in one screen. It mm. would be beautiful. If you look at any, and Microsoft has made a point of, of showing these shots, when they show like the pictures hub or the music and video hub. They'll show it wide. They'll show it wide. Well, mm -hmm. imagine that on a single screen. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. But uh, finally, finally, you know, I mean, we've been almost begging here. You know, give us a, throw us a bone, you know. Um, and For, yeah, we'll see. Maybe they will. Throw us a freaking bone. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see here. I'm looking at the time. I think we probably. Um, we don't have time. We don't have time. It's fine. I wouldn't mind doing a few of these, uh, especially given the the bad news. We want to because mm -hmm. uh, let's take it. Let's take a little break. We'll do an audible pick of the week. We do not have any um, tips or hints or picks or anything. So, yeah, it's only been three or four days. So. Yeah, it's not enough time to get uh, get those together. Holiday week. Holiday week. We're going to give you a little break. Let's do the audible, and then uh, we will do a live Q and A with the chat room. So if you're in the chat room, irc.twit.tv, uh, start thinking of questions for Paul. And uh, I will uh, we'll get to his But anything. It could be about anything. About anything. Meanwhile, though, it's time the to... The Atari ST, the Amiga, whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Anything you're interested in. Uh, meanwhile, let's talk a little bit about my good friends at Audible.com. I, I was saying before we began, you know, mm -hmm. I, only, I only get two books a month on Audible. <laughs> only. Right. And uh, I, I, it, my renewal is too far away, and I've just been dying for this Keith uh, Richards book. And then right. I'm reading uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower series, and I'm almost done with volume three, and I need, I need, I need. You are never going to finish that. I need never gonna... volume four. Well, you know, they're starting you, to get when long you get to now. The part, when you get to the part with the mechanical bear. Oh, past that. Oh, you did. And the, and the lobstrosities. Oh, no, that's like oh, yeah. in the second or third book. Really? Oh, no. oh, yeah. Oh, look at you. Okay. Oh, it gets better. You know what? It, the first two books are kind of not so good. I like the first one. It was written a long time it's ago. Very it's very dry. A bunch of short stories. Yeah, but it's, it's got a... It's got a, in an, there's something about it, you know? No, it, uh, it, I, believe me, I didn't have any trouble finishing it. It goes up and it. down after that, I would say. Yeah, but, and, but now I'm really kind of enjoying it. And uh, this is, they're in the, they're in the city of uh, Ludd right now and, and yep, making their yep. escape on, the, on Blaine. And, I'm, and it's fun. The train, I'm really, right? That goes. Yeah, shh, across, don't, you know, no spoilers. But yeah, it. yeah. So now you know yep. there's a bear, a mechanical bear, and a train. Anyway, um, but there's, how many of those are there? Of the books? Of the Dark Tower. There's like eight or nine. So this, yeah, I'm not sure. I know there's at least eight. At least, yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven. Yeah, I was going to say seven. Seven. But I, yeah, it's... So I'm, uh, I'm going to number four. The, okay. uh, I just finished the. I'm finishing the Wastelands. So I could. This is how bad I spent a hundred bucks. I bought four books. I couldn't. It was like I need. I need a fix. This is how much I love Audible. Oh no, Leo. He's what? going to write a new one. Another Dark Tower's coming? Yeah. Well, I guess, don't tell me, but I'm, I'm, I just bought The Wizard and Glass. Now, this one's 27 hours. There's a big jump in length. Some of them, some of them are humongous, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So this yep. one's one of the long ones. And then uh, Steve Martin's new book came out today. Okay. And, uh, and I had, I've already ordered it in uh, An Object of Beauty. I'd already ordered it in uh, um, hardcover, but I, but I 
I want to listen to it because I'm going to I'm going to be interviewing Steve on Sunday to talk about this book. So there you go. There's another one. So finally, I just said, oh, screw it. I'm just going to buy these. You know, it might have been a Stephen King interview in which, in fact, it was. It was a it was a story about the Kindle. And he said, you know, I love the Kindle. I get it. I have one. I buy my books on it. He goes, but there's something about books because he's an old school yeah. guy. I love books. So he, sa he says for a lot of these new hardcovers. He actually buys the book so he can put it up on his shelf and have it there. Yeah. But then he reads it on the Kindle because he doesn't have to cart it along that. <laughs> I do know. the kind of the same thing. If I really like a book, I buy the hardcover, but I listen to yeah. it on Audible because I'm just a big Audible fan. Sure. I, I like being read to. Campbell Scott reads the new um, uh, Steve Martin book, and I really like it. You have a Steve Stephen King book to recommend for us today. Yeah. This is his latest book, and I, I literally just finished it yesterday. You liked it? I loved it. Although I have to caution people, this is a, this is an old school, if you will, Stephen it's, King it's book. Horror, it's a horror. Right? It's yeah. horror. It's yeah. four stories, three of which I guess would qualify as novellas. Uh, one is just a short story, so it kind of harkens back to some of his earlier stuff. If you like his um, early short story books or um, Four Past Midnight, which was also four stories, very very much on those uh, on those veins. And um, yeah, there's some horrific stuff in here. Oh, I mean, it's, good. It's pretty, it's pretty brutal, but it's one of those can't put down type things, and uh, it's fantastic, and it is a nice return to form for him because you know uh, some of his newer books, uh, if it's uh, one of the longer books, like Under the Dome, you know where he. I, really, I haven't read that yet. And I still want to read that. It's a great book, but then he doesn't really know how to end it. It's it's almost too long, and right. and there's no obvious way to kind of wrap it up in a way that is satisfying. But uh, this is a great, uh, it's a great, great book uh, with the understanding that it is a horror book. See, that's how he solved the Dark Tower problem. He just never ended it. Yeah. <laughs> just keep going. I the can't. Dark Tower may be the, yeah, the emblematic of his... I can't finish <laughs> Neil it. Neil Stevenson is like this. You know, he yeah. has a trouble winding yeah, it down. Yeah, Quicksilver went on, and the Baroque cycle oh, went on and on and on. I never finished that. No, me neither. That's on Audible, too. I yeah. find that I can, I can finish books that I would... For instance, I'm going to try... Um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. it uh, Infinite Jest. Which I've mm -hmm. tried to read like yeah. fifty times. David Foster Wallace's enormous novel. It's a little opaque, but I find that these things on Audible are great because you listen and it kind of washes over you, and you actually end up reading long, difficult books easier. It's I maybe it's just me. I should try Neil Stevenson on Audible yeah. because I, I just couldn't get through no. those books, and I can't wait to uh, to I I've got the Baroque Cycle as well. I mean, I have a lot of books. I've I just was looking. I joined Audible January 2000. My 11th anniversary with Audible is coming up. I have over 400 books in my Audible bookshelf. And that's one of the things I really like about Audible is those books are always available to you. You can download them again. And, you know, I think books are one of those things you often do reread or re-listen in this case. Audible.com. Here's what you do. Go to audible.com slash windows. It's not going to cost you a penny. You, you'll sign up for the gold account. That's a book a month. The first month is free. The first book is free. It could be Full Dark, No Stars, the new Stephen King. Or, you know, there's a ton of stuff. However, word of warning. <laughs> Don't read a lot, you know, like something like The Dark Tower, because then you've got to get another one, another one, another one. And you, 10 years later, you'll go, I've been a member forever. I'm hooked. And I actually, I'd love to get you hooked. Audible.com slash Windows. You can cancel before the first month is up and not pay a penny. And the book is yours to keep. Plays on everything, you know, the Kindle, the, the Zune. Uh, of course, all the uh, Apple devices all the Android devices. Uh, in fact, they've got a great uh, Audible application for both Android and iPhone. I just love. Audible.com slash Windows. They're bringing reading back into people's lives. When you're at the gym, when you're in the car, wherever you are, you can read. And uh, I, I'm very grateful to them. I love them. And there's your uh, pick of the week from Mr. Thrott. Full Dark, No Stars from Stephen King. All right, sir. I have in front of me a yep. chat room loaded with people <laughs> loaded with questions for you yeah uh let me find i'm not gonna there's this one is about linux versus windows that's mm -hmm. not i'm not gonna do that all right whatever you know any do you have any idea about zoom pass coming to canada Sorry. yeah that's not microsoft's I, issue is it because it, it's the same thing happened with uh with apple it's just very it's you got to do all these deals I, I would just say this you know and i hope i'm wrong here but with the zoom stuff they tend to come out and do something and then you don't hear from them again for months and months and months and the something they just did was they announced sort of the expansion of Zoom into different territories, but it's so scattershot and different everywhere that it's hard to even keep track of who has what. You know, where if you're in a certain country, you could open up the Zoom PC software and have access to T 
TV rent, you know, TV purchases, but not movie rentals, you know, that kind of stuff. And I wish there was a more, I just don't get the vibe from these people that they're on any kind of decent trajectory toward, you know, slowly over time, releasing more and more and more places. So I would like to be able to say, yeah, you know, in early 2011, you'll be able to get Zoom Pass in Canada, but you know what? We could all die before it happens. And I, I just don't, I don't know, I, you know, and they don't want to talk about it. So um, I'm sorry. I wish I had something to say there. Bradley 605 asks this question. Paul, Springsteen, the Promise box set, or Paul McCartney band on the run box set, which do you recommend? Um, those both suck terribly. And I would, <laughs> no, just, no, I'm they, not a Springsteen fan, although oh, I am. Uh, oh, I the am. only Springsteen album I ever liked was um, not Nebraska, but the one with the, uh, it was probably the one right after Nebraska. Um, the River? No, no, no. This is later than that. Um, see, I don't know much about uh, anyway. I almost have to look it up. I'm sorry. I would I'm say noticed. Springsteen over McCartney any day. Although I am not a fan of Paul McCartney's solo work no. for a few the good most things. part. You know, it's yeah. funny that Paul McCartney box set does not have Baby I'm Amazed, which is frankly his only good or one of his few good, really good songs. I guess I like he, band he has a couple, you know, you could, he has, I mean. But his silly it, love it, songs was what really did me in. I, and John Lennon as well, as it turns out. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> killed John. You know, it just killed yeah. him. Just kill. yeah. How long, he said, uh, Leo's brain asks. <laughs> Leo's brain. <laughs> you and Paul have what I would call a special dynamic. How long have you known each other and how did you meet? I called Paul. When I yep. was decided I wanted to do a Windows show, I said there's only one person I would even consider for a Windows show. Paul Therotta. We'd never met. I called right. you, and you said yes, and that's it. I said yes, but I'm going to France. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, you might have said that. <laughs> I said, I'll have to call you in a month. <laughs> when I come back, yeah. But but, but it, there was just no question in my mind when I said yeah. I wanted to do a Windows you know, show. From this my perspective, I think, and this is probably true of everyone who watches this now or watched Leo on, on tech TV or whatever. I mean, I... I used to see him on TV and I, I, because of your personality, or whatever, I always felt like I knew you. So, um, moving to this was very easy for me because you are exactly as you appear to be <laughs> an Apple loving clown. No, <laughs> a, 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 I mean, you, you know, it's, you're very much, you know, as you appear. I mean, so it's, it makes it very easy. Thank you. Uh, Moss puppet says, Paul, put your black <laughs> ops pop it, po poster on the wall instead of your windows blinds <laughs> cover up. That's a statement, not a question. Gotcha. Pickwit, question for Message Paul. Message received. <laughs> Message received. Do you think there'll be tight integration between Windows 8 and Windows Phone 7? And if so, uh, on what order? So Microsoft has gone to great lengths to detach Windows Phone from the PC or from any other you know, computer, which is a very interesting move for Microsoft and, uh, and completely contrary to the backwards compatibility stuff that we talked about. So they've left out people like... Uh, people who use Outlook to store all their stuff locally on the PC cannot sync to um, Windows Phone. And a lot of people have complained about that. I think that Microsoft did the right thing. Thus, very clearly, they will very tightly integrate Windows Phone with Windows in the future because Microsoft can never walk away from this backwards compatibility thing. And I right. fully expect them to cave on that. So I would expect there, yeah, there'll be more integration in the future. Um, Mubi says, mm -hmm. question for both of us. How do you like the Windows Phone UI after a few weeks of use? Now I got to tell you, Paul's been using it for s six months or so. Yep. So I'm never. I'm. I can't look back. You really love it. I'm, I love it. I love it. And I there has never been a moment where I, I've ever looked at another, you know, an Android phone or the iPhone and said, oh, oh you know, I missed this or I missed that. nothing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. I'm. I'm very. I am still impressed with it. And another question was what what uh, uh, prioritize what uh, features. Microsoft should add first, and I have to say, I don't really, I, I don't really think that that's the issue with Windows Phone Seven. I don't miss cut and paste. Nope. Um, I think mostly it's it's get Evernote on there, get a few of the apps that I that I use on the yeah, I, there, right. That's a good point. There, there's some key stuff that still isn't on there, uh, including things like Windows Live Messenger. You know, although you have to think that when multitasking occurs across the board, that's going to make a lot more sense. Um, I think a lot of what needs to occur is small fit and finish type stuff. And like you said, the introduction of just those, you know, angry birds, you yeah, know, on the game yeah. side or whatever. But they've done and a that, great job, I have to say. I mean, they, yeah. the, 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 the range and quality of apps on Windows Phone 7 out of the box all, yeah. is superb. Yeah. Yep. The other thing, by the way, and this doesn't get enough press, but um, 
the other thing that has to occur, this isn't necessarily from Microsoft, but it's more along uh, with third-party developers and their understanding of how the system works. You know, Microsoft engineered the system with these hubs and integrated experiences and all this, and it ships with some very basic stuff. But what I really want to see is Google or some third party write an integration piece into, say, the Pictures Hub, where my photos up on Google show up in a folder in the photo gallery and not as some sort of, you know, part of a feed. You know, I, I want it to be a native part of the phone, just like Facebook photos can be, just like your photos on Windows Live can be, and just like those photos, obviously, that you have on the phone are. Um, I want third parties to embrace that and not release a Facebook app and not I release a, a smug mug app and all that stuff that's going to happen anyway, which is fine. But I also want that integration right into the system. That's the beauty of Windows Phone. And I think... Can a developer yeah. do that, though? Or doesn't Microsoft yes. have to do that? Nope, they can do it. It just has to happen. And, it, I, you know, as with... So there's Connect, an API as with to, like... Yeah, Invo to extend, you know, yeah. extend it. Oh, that's really Seven interesting. Hubs, yeah. That yep. would be so much better than right. a separate Smug Mug app. Just extend the photo hub. Yeah. Now, from the perspective of... Smug Mug, which is owned by HP, I think, right? Is no, that Smug? No, it's standalone. Oh, no, it's Snapfish. Uh, okay. Snapfish. So from the yeah. from the perspective of Smug Mug, let's say, which is a standalone company, apparently, whatever it is. Yes. They they have a brand and they're promoting their brand. And one of the ways that you can promote the brand is to have a Smug Mug application that sits there and has its own icon, so you associate it with Smug Mug, and you have to get over that mentality because when you integrate it deeply into the phone, what you're doing is giving the person who is both a Smug Mug subscriber or user as well as a Windows Phone owner, an incredible experience. But it's one that is a little harder to promote the brand in, right? Because it just becomes a seamless part of the phone. And I think that's part of the top, the, the tough sell here. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you're talking about a, I don't know about Smug Mug in particular, but they must have APIs. You know, it must be possible for a third party to write a Smug Mug application or whatever. And if that's true, then there's no reason that a third party couldn't do this. I just like to see the big guys do it themselves. You know, I'd like to see, fa well, Facebook's already in there, so Facebook arguably kind of has done it themselves. But They you know, did a standalone, but there is good integration into the hubs. Right, they have both. Yeah. So I, I want to see this occur for Flickr, you know, Picasso Web on Google, Smug Mug, Snapfish, whatever. I want it, this needs to be everything. And I think it will be over time, but right now it's, more of a promise than a reality. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see how it works with Facebook. I think that's the, the poster child. But I want it for everything else, if that makes sense. Yes, no, it completely makes sense. I think Smug Mug actually is a company that gets that. And yeah, I think so, too. If, of, yeah. of all the companies out there, might be the most likely. Flickr's already integrated, isn't it? Not no, in that way. It's not. not it should way. be, though. Yeah. Yeah, you can do implicit integration through uh, a feed, but that doesn't, you know... <laughs> attaching your your Flickr account to your Windows Live ID allows you to share stuff you're doing on Flickr over Windows Live. Over Windows Live, it doesn't help it get on your right. phone, right? right? Um, you would have to, and it, it, this is kind of one of those stupid little. I'm going to say this, and if you understand what I'm saying, it's gonna it is going to sound as dumb as it is, <laughs> but it is it is one way to get stuff on the phone, which is this: create a second Windows Live ID. Use that Windows Live ID to share out all of your content from all of your services. Flickr, Google, whatever, Pandora, all those things you can attach to it. And then friend yourself with your primary Windows Live ID. <laughs> Think about it, because then your updates will show up on your phone, right? Yeah, because I, I have attached my main ID to everything, smug bug, right. and it right. doesn't show up. So what you're saying doesn't is make show another up one. What you're, what you're doing with Windows Live is sharing over Windows Live. Right? right, with so others. So I need to share with, with myself. Yourself. I have to share with myself. I know. How dumb is that? Right. Well, it's actually kind of a cool workaround. I hadn't really thought of it. I I, I probably never stated this explicitly because one of the problems writing the book as fast as I did was I had so many different configurations. Right. You it's can not do always, it. You did as it. I'm, as I'm talking about it, it's not always obvious. You know, people would ask me, "How come I don't have Facebook here?" And I'm thinking, you know, there are three different ways you can get Facebook on this phone, and I don't remember <laughs> off the top of my head which one right. does which. You know, I don't know. I have to go look it up, you know, sometimes. And this is one of those things. I had done this. You know, you um, – and people will write me and say, you know, you were talking about getting Flickr on the phone, and I don't see Flickr on the phone. And I look at my phone now because I've reset it a few times, and I'm like, I don't see Flickr on my phone either. Why is that? And it takes a while to remember – 
you know, uh, one, one of the things I did over the process of writing the book was come up with all these stupid workarounds. You know, it only accepts uh, primary calendars. Well, how do you work around that? Um, you could start multiple calendars, I guess. You could have, you know, three Google accounts each with a different right. calendar. That's so I, dumb. I ain't doing that. You know, no, but it would solve the problem. It would. Or mush yeah. every calendar into one, which is what you did. Which is actually what I do right. do in real life. Right. Yeah. But I looked at different things. You know, you try to, when there's a problem, you have to come up with a solution. It's not always, you know, <laughs> technically excellent like right. Windows 3.0. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's at least it works. Like Windows 3. .0. Paul in the UK says, what's your best guess for when the next Xbox is out? Xbox 720, perhaps. I, I don't know, and I can't even imagine what form it's going to take. You know, they have very effectively extended the lifetime of this console. I agree um, with Connect and uh, Connect, and and with this new hardware rev, which, which really has made a difference. Yeah, people, you know, even this year there are games that are so beautiful and so much better looking than things that have come before that you get the feeling they're still, you know, taking advantage of those underlying capabilities in new ways. So, I think that it's going to be at least, you know, three years or so before we hear what they're going to do next. I, it wouldn't surprise me to discover that the next Xbox is something we can't even foresee today. You know, maybe something a little more like that on live thing where they, you know, it seems crazy at the time, but they actually are going to scale back on the hardware, but still deliver through their right. incredible cloud data centers, this crazy experience or whatever. I mean, I, I'm sure they're looking at different things, but I don't know. Web but certainly the way the Xbox this is good. Web today. 900 wants to know what your recommendation today is for a home theater PC. And he says off the shelf with the ability to record one channel on a built-in tuner. Right. Which I would say is a fundamental capability of any home theater PC. <laughs> yep. Except for one thing. I actually recommend not recording broadcast TV on a computer. And I think that a better integration point in some ways might be to look into these internet services yeah uh, i really not do, like the roku i have to say uh, i don't yeah so i actually spent um a lot of time last night yelling at, it was at the apple tv in this case we had just finished watching the last series of the tutors mm -hmm. and there was some supplemental material mm -hmm. and it will not connect to my computer all of a sudden so it, it worked long enough to let us watch the show and now it no longer sees my computer on the home <laughs> network I, I wanted to kill this thing yeah uh, now, that's not a computer, obviously. I, I agree with you on the Roku box. I think that we're, it, it's still early days, but if you're looking at a um, a computer for the living room, if you're going to do that, I think you would look at something like that. You know, the Dell, I think it's called the Xenio, or that little... That little box. Mac mini-looking thing that they yeah. have, yeah. Um, assuming that there's a TV tuner capability there, you know. But it, it's a tough thing because, obviously, if you're going to go the TV tuner route, you want to go HD, cable right. card, all that stuff. And I don't know that those little appliance type PCs have that capability. You're not going to do a USB TV tuner card if you're serious about it. You could do over the air, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, and something I haven't, frankly, experimented with enough here. Although the times I've done it, I mean, the, the quality of the TV signal that you can get over, over the air, HD channels locally, is actually pretty excellent. Um, and then, of course, there are things like BoxyBox where you get... Um, or Boxy, the TV software, uh, that you can get on the PC and get a lot of that content with ads sometimes and in varying quality levels, obviously. Um, I don't know. We're in a period of transition. I uh, Windows Media Center has obviously sat still for a little while. We'll have to see what, if anything, occurs to that in Windows 8 and so forth. But I don't, I don't know that I have enough experience yet with the actual PCs. It's A PC is on my list to compare against all the set-top boxes we've been talking about and I've been writing about, but... I haven't gotten there yet, so I don't really have much to say yet, I guess. Um, oh, I had a good one, and then it scrolled off here. Oh, our last question. Okay. <laughs> Where's the Twit app on Windows Phone 7? Oh, that's a good question. It should be done anytime soon. I should yeah, Dimitri asking. released it. I think we screwed him up a little bit with one of our shows, the Tech Guy video. Okay. Uh, but I don't know if, he's, if that's enough to, uh, to be uh, a long-term problem. Or, you know, if he's going to want to fix it. Um, but we're expecting that very soon. And it's, and it's gorgeous. So that's a third, third party, as with all of our apps. Well, you think I have in-house developers? Uh, <laughs> the volunteers who just very kindly make them.
Yeah. And uh, and he did a great, Dimitri great job. Dimitri did a great job. It was one of the first most beautiful Windows Phone 7 apps I ever saw. So, by the way, um, that Dell tablet, I think, might now be for sale. It's called the Inspiron Duo. Inspiron Duo. Yeah, have you looked this thing up? No, I'm lo I, you know, I looked for what you said, which was an old this one. Is, this is very interesting. And uh, look it, up right now. Uh, it is. It's basically a netbook. It's a convertible tablet. Yeah. But it's not a high-powered thing. No, 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 no. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Apparently, no. It's, a, it's a... But this is interesting. And the, the, oh, look at... Oh, yeah, this... I thought this was very odd. It's in a... Uh, it's, it's in a, a Microsoft it's ad. A, it's a spinner. Yeah. <laughs> Which is... Very yeah. odd. I mean, it's just... It's a convertible. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, it's in many ways nothing that we haven't had for a while, but... Obviously, the world is very interested in tablets right now. So, you know, they're like, well, we've, you know, we know how to make these. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a, a netbook with a screen that can, you know, convert into a... And it's Windows, it's Windows 7. It is Windows 7 Home Premium, yep. Two gigs of RAM, 10-inch screen, 1366 by 768, 320 gigabyte hard drive, Intel Video... You know, it's a, it's a basic netbook, I would say. How much? Uh, dual, dual core, five fifty. Wow! So it's the same price as a iPad. Yeah, but it's a computer. Wow! Now, see, I think that's a compelling product. Now, it's not going to ship. It's an until Atom processor, so it's not. Even though it's but dual it is, core, but Atom. it's a, but it's dual core Atom processor. Yeah. That does actually make a difference. Does it? I haven't tried the new ones. Yeah, yeah. I think you know that that initial generation of Atom processors and all those netbooks that came out, including the one that I still have are borderline useless, right? You know, a, a single core Atom processor with a gigabyte of RAM is like, you might as well just poke your eye, in the, you know, in the, yep. with a stick and it's awful. Um, but this, I don't, this is interesting. I mean, this is, well, I'll, I'll look at this one. Uh, not because I need such a thing, but I, you know, if I don't, I think all hell will break loose. I mean, <laughs> I, there, there is, there is a thing on the, on the windows side where, I think there's some desperation in certain quarters that we need to react in some way, you know, to the iPad. Right. And I'm not even honestly positive that that's the case, but, um, but I'm, I'm in the minority. So I, I think I will be You're looking the only at one. The only one who feels that way. I, uh, Everybody yeah. else is freaked out. <laughs> they are freaked out. I don't, you know, it's selling one tenth as you much as the lowest. You, you know what? I think it might be the, the one that it really needs to, be a threat is this uh, uh yeah although, except Air. for one thing so yeah but you know that's that's a very typical apple product oh it is it's, it's very expensive, expensive for what it is um it probably runs windows fantastically well i haven't tried it um that's an interesting question i haven't tried that i bet it does i bet it does i i, I think the big thing that uh, is exciting about that particular card uh, um, uh computer rather is the battery life you know and the incredible portability of it, of course. Um, That's what I like. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very decent screen. Yeah. I, I still, you know, I, I desperately want something that's small and light like that. But the reality of my situation is I what I really need is something with a huge screen right. and, you know, huge amounts of storage and all this stuff. And it's just, it, these things just don't go hand in hand for me. You know, I would love to be able to use something like that. I dream about using something like that. Traveling with something that you don't, even feel is in the bag, right, you know, right. I mean, how awesome would that be? And th this is just not my, right. I mean, this it's is just, just not it's kind car. of a netbook with a little more juice, a little more, yeah. oof. but it's, you know, two to three times as much as a netbook. Right. Right? It's a thousand. Yeah. That's yeah. Twice as much, twice as much as that Dell. Paul Therat is the editor in chief of the super site for windows, winsupersite.com. Please just do yourself a favor. If you like windows and if you use it, it just read the articles there. It's just great. His blog is also there. Uh, he is, uh, also a news editor for windows it pro, uh, an analyst for Penton media and the author of the fabulous windows phone secrets, which is out now. And if you have a windows phone, you should get that. If you have windows seven, you get windows seven secrets. Also a must have volume. Paul, we if you don't, you should get you should get both. If you don't have Windows Seven or Windows Phone, you get, should get both. Get both, because uh, then you and can the use books. them as a stand for your MacBook Air, and it's just fantastic. <laughs> so <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Let me just see. Let me just...
Let me just try that out. I think it might might work quite nicely. Here's the old Windows Vista secrets. I'm not using that uh, much. Oh, yeah, that's great. Props it up very... Right. <laughs> Doing the turducken thing? You, sir, have hurt me for the last time. <laughs> I've cut you to the quick, have I? Turducken into uh, uh, this weekend and then this Thanksgiving? Leo, what are you let doing? Let me tell you something what I feel very doing? strongly about. Yes. Cannot mess around with Thanksgiving. Do not mess with Thanksgiving. No. If you, you, can, you can serve anything you want on Christmas and New Year's Day or whatever. Right. Thanksgiving but is turkey. Thanksgiving is turkey. It, it, whether you like it or not. Yeah. You know, it's just... Paul, you you'll, you'll, you'll rejoice to know that I am, in fact, a great traditionalist, which is why I've already, on Twitter, put on my pilgrim outfit. <laughs> nice. Because I... We, yeah, you want to see you, it? I, I yeah, do want to see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I believe... Yeah, the, I believe that uh, celebrating Thanksgiving involves dressing up as a pilgrim. <laughs> it involves dress... What doesn't involve dressing For me, up? everything. Uh, notice, by the way, that my pilgrim outfit is embroidered with, with a pink... With uh, the L. Yeah. L. There's nothing emasculating about that in the slightest. <laughs> I don't know how that. And don't let anyone tell you differently. Maybe the lavender bow. I don't. You know. I think uh, <laughs> Governor Bradford question. would have loved this outfit. Don't you think? It, it, you are right now killing Indians with your diseases. This is uh, this is the Glee Thanksgiving. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, thank. <laughs> Twitter.com slash Leo Laporte if you want to see it for yourself. Paul, thank you so much. We uh, we are out of time, but um, have a great Thanksgiving. We will be back recording on our regular time a week from Thursday uh, at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC at live.twit.tv. Paul, okay. uh, enjoy your turkey. I will. You too. All right. See you next time on Windows Weekly.